Hey everyone, Dr. Z, I got Dr. Marty McCary here, author of The Price We Pay, which just won like the business book of like the world. What, what did you win? <laughs> business book of the year. Business book of the year. That's like pimp of the year. That's like <laughs> Good huge. Good to see you, Zubin. Yeah. Well, so you've been all over the news. You're, you know, obviously public health trained uh, surgeon, Johns Hopkins. The Price We Pay was a great book because it talked about all the money games that we do in healthcare. And I'll refer people in a link to the interview we did before, but we've done a bunch of talks. Right now, though, you're focused like everyone, including myself, on this coronavirus thing, particularly vaccines, man. What are you saying? You're the, the editor in chief of MedPage today, so you have a good platform to get your uh, ideas out. Well, what's, what's the latest? Well, Zubin, um, First of all, I'm really enjoying the public health side of things. You know, I spend probably 80 to 90% of my time doing public health research. And uh, right now it's sort of like, there's so many things out there that need to be said that are not being said, that it's a good time to use as many different platforms as possible to get the word out. For example, why have we seen a massive deceleration in cases in the last three, four weeks. Massive. I mean, it's almost going to be half the number of cases that we had during the peak on January 8th. We're probably starting to see herd immunity kick in. And when people say, hey, wait a minute, there's only 26 million cases confirmed. So you can't have that much natural immunity. Well, guess what? We're only confirming one in four to one in 10 cases. So 26 million is really 104 million to 200 plus million and we may start be starting to see herd immunity kick in. That's the good news, if we can beat out these variants. And then why are we giving the vaccine to people who really should not be getting it right now? People who have had the infection in the past. And why are we giving two vaccines at a time when we're significantly supply constrained? I think if we can give out the vaccine smarter, rather than giving it out to people already immune, uh, people who already had the infection, who already got one dose, who are young and healthy and shouldn't be first in line. Yes, all those people should get to a two dose vaccine regimen, but not right now, not while old people are sitting ducks in this war when we're losing two or 3000 a day. So uh, there's a lot of inequity right now in this vaccine allocation. So. I think it's a time to, to really reevaluate. Yeah, you know, this is worth discussing because like, uh, <laughs> by, by the way, even just saying that the words herd immunity are enough to get my entire Facebook channel canceled. So like, <laughs> it, it, it's it's ridiculous, Marty. Well, like, like even just interviewing you like is enough to get me canceled. Like they, they're so, you can't even have a discussion anymore without the algorithm pegging you as misinformation. The term, the term is polarizing because it became politicized because it's a terrible strategy, right? The herd immunity is a terrible strategy. And so people associate that term with the strategy, right. okay? I totally am against that strategy. But the reality is if we can use a friendlier term, we are seeing slowing, okay? We are observing slowing. How else do you explain a having in the number of daily new cases in the last three to four weeks. Do you think, Half, okay, 50% reduction. Do you think that what happens is, so her, herd immunity and devel developing some community immunity threshold, and we'll talk about the two vaccine regimen too, because I think that's key. Um, do you think some of it is because we had this big surge in uh, infections over the holidays when people got together and those are starting to peter out and then people auto-regulate their behavior, so now they're more scared, they're putting masks on, they're not going out, there's less tr less travel and connection and that's why we're seeing the drop? Or, or do you think it's we're actually starting to generate overall uh, greater levels of uh, community immunity? Well, look, we, we definitely saw a bump for sure after each holiday and special occasion. But the reality is, how do you explain a 50% reduction in the last three or four weeks, there's only 330 million people in this country, okay? When 100 to 200 plus million have, have some natural immunity, which by the way, the old guard medical establishment has been very dismissive of, right? Right. Basically telling people, even if you had the infection, you still need to get two vaccine doses. Mm -hmm. But the reality is that immunity is pretty good in the short term. Yeah, so so let's get to that. So that's interesting. So yeah, I agree. I think that there is a, an effect of uh, this 
community infection rate. And I think there's some pre-existing immunity too, some T-cell pre-existing immunity, which we talked about early in the pandemic. It's not as high as we might've hoped it was, but it's there. And then the idea that, you know, you've got 22 million people vaccinated already. And so that's adding a little bit to the community. Um, uh, unfortunately, they're not necessarily the highest risk people that got vaccinated, like you said. And this question- Hospital administrator spouses, <laughs> I mean- <laughs> Hospital administrator spouses, right? No, they're really high risk because how will they get on their golden yacht if they're coughing a little with an asymptomatic case of COVID because they're asymptomatic because their metabolic health is great because they can eat nice because they're rich, you know? Well, hospital administrator spouses over the age of 65, they're the ones I support getting the vaccine. One dose right now. So, the other ones we'll have to have a separate conversation about. So let's talk about the single dose thing because you mentioned variants and all of this makes sense in the absence of variants. When we start seeing variants with some degree of resistance to vaccine, not frank vaccine escape yet, but just resistance. The problem like Offit would bring up say is um, if you just get one dose, you're not generating as much immunogenicity as natural infection uh, in the trials. And so as a result, you're setting yourself up for possible viral replication in the setting of some pressure to evolve away from vaccine instead of suppressing at a level that will actually prevent replication. So do you worry about that with a single dose vaccine regimen? The question is not, should we have a single dose regimen? The question is, should we delay that second dose uh. further out? And if so, will it be more effective? Yeah. Okay. Now I, I, I'm plunging into this controversy knowing that I'm going to be mislabeled as a one dose single vaccine advocate. Okay. And I'm not, what I'm saying is let's look at the data. The Pfizer data is now public, by the way, why the heck does the FDA not make public the applications once they get them? When they got the Pfizer application, that afternoon they should have made it public, in my opinion. Mm. Okay, I, sorry, I just believe in transparency. I agree. They release it after they authorize it, okay? Once they did, we looked deeper, and guess what? 91% effectiveness of the vaccine seven days after the second dose, when we know that second dose hasn't kicked in yet. It just doesn't, physiologically. So that 91% protection you see after four weeks after the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine is the efficacy in the short term of the first dose. Mm. Okay, the Moderna trial, the study just came out, 80% efficacy in a month after the first dose. The UK has now said, officially, try to wait 12 weeks for your second dose. Other vaccines, are they more effective if you wait? or are they more effective if you give a second dose within a month? In general, to quote Dr. Pollard in the UK, head of the Oxford uh, vaccine group, in general, vaccines work better the longer you spread them out. HPV works better at one year than when you give a second dose at one month. Other vaccines, the same. So the question is, as we're significantly supply constrained, why would you choose to protect 50 people with 95% protection when you could protect 100 people at 91% protection or thereabouts? That is the ethical question right in front of us. And this directly translates into public policy, what we tell our patients, what we do for ourselves and what we say in social media. Yeah, I think this makes a lot of sense because what you're making a distinction is there's the practical supply constraint right now. So if the goal is generate as much community immunity as rapidly as you can, and actually that's gonna have an anti-variant effect. So if, if we're worried about variants taking hold, as many people as can be immunized quickly means less replicatable, real estate for virus to get a foothold and to generate new variant, et cetera. So that's gonna be a key component of it. As far as immunogenicity goes, that's an interesting point that some of those vaccines, like like you said, HPV, um, you space longer out. I, I'm gonna talk to Offit on Friday, so I'll ask him these questions. I think it's worth asking because this has been an interesting discussion. Now, this is the kind of discussion we ought to have because it's a mix of policy, like the effector organ of science. Like you can talk about the science all you want, but if you, if you can't execute it, then what, what does it matter? And this idea of who should be getting it, right? And 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 in what, in what, you know, like today I'm supposed to get my second dose of Moderna. And I know you've gone on record. Don't do it. I, I, yeah, I know, just don't do it, right? But the thing is, not, I don't think they're gonna give it to a new patient. They held it back specifically for a second dose for healthcare workers. I know you've gone on record and said, you're not gonna get the vaccine until the supply constraint. Did you get it or no? 
no, I'm going to, I, I'm, my personal risk is too low and I don't see enough patients to really be a transmission risk. And our protocols are so good in surgery that I'm not going to get it until every high risk American has been offered it first in principle. And I don't blame people who are getting it, healthcare workers who have received it. That's what they were told to do. That's what they did. But in principle, I'm trying to say, look, 80% of the deaths are on people over 65. Let's hit them first with a simple age-based allocation strategy. There's less decision paralysis at the hospitals and at the state level, and they can roll out vaccines faster that way. That's why uh, Israel has vaccinated over half its population. That's right. And I think there's a lot of validity to that uh, angle in the sense of pragmatism and also saving lives. So if you're purely looking at saving lives, who's dying? It's the people over 65 that are at high risk. Yeah, look, and, and things are different from the, from the spring. Remember in March and April, we were giving people a lot of infections, right? We were transmitting a lot of infection. A lot of people came to the hospital and got the infection. That's different now. Our protocols are much better. Now, look, if you're an at-risk ICU worker, take 10 vaccines for all I care, right? That, that person probably should be in the formal two-dose protocol. Right. But the vast majority of healthcare workers, you know, one dose is pretty good and we should probably take it in turn at, uh, with an age-based allocation. By the way, I love Offit and I, I respect what he has to say, but a couple observations. Number one, in general, the U.S. experts have been in a bit of an academic ivory tower disconnected from the fact that on the ground we're rationing a scarce resource. Okay, that's the first disconnect. The second is there's a massive disconnect between UK doctors and US experts, mm, okay. okay? Massive disconnect. They have official guidance from the, from the experts and the endorsed by the government saying, try to delay your second dose out to 12 weeks, and they may increase it further. In general, they've done better as an expert group. They've approved the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. We haven't, right? We're sitting on a, you know, hoping another trial rolls in. They do rolling reviews. We don't do rolling reviews at the FDA. Our experts have been dismissive of the effectiveness of a single dose. They are talking a lot about it. Uh, they did the steroid trial. US experts said it didn't meet our elaborate standards. Of course, that trial ultimately proved that steroids reduced mortality by over a third. There is a massive disconnect across, across the Atlantic Ocean between UK experts and US experts. So just something to keep in mind when you hear US experts speaking. I, I think that's really interesting because you know that in the UK, since they have nationalized health, they think uh, in a systems approach much more, I think, than uh, maybe the academic uh, ivory tower sort of fragmented approach we have here. So maybe that's a component of it. But it's worth, it, This is these are the conversations we need to have and we need to be debating publicly, right? Assuming Facebook doesn't cancel us for even talking any of this stuff. But, and I say this, <laughs> I say this because Facebook recently penalized me for, things that they wouldn't even explain what they were. They just go, oh, we've shut down this account, we've closed this. And I'm like, why? Why? They won't even tell you. Um, and I think if we're gonna have discourse about anything, you better have an open platform to be able to do it, right? Especially when misinformation is spreading so fast, if you can't actually counter it with rational discourse, right? So I mean, so 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 what 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 is your call to action on what we should do then? Should we just say, spread it out to 12 weeks, give it to old people first, stop giving it to hospital administrators? Like, what's your what's your plan? Well, Zubin, I've dodged the uh, AI algorithms over there at Facebook for now, <laughs> although I've had some, <laughs> some close calls. And, you know, AI cracks me up because people always say, oh, you know, we, you need in healthcare, you need AI, and AI can help with this, and AI, and I tell them, look, we don't need AI, we just need I. <laughs> right now okay we just need basic eye no one has ever died from missing their their second dose for delaying their second dose okay let's use i okay and let's recognize that we can double our vaccine capacity instantly if we look at the data on how effective the first dose is and delay that second dose until we have the capacity to immunize more people, that's number one. Number two, so let's stop immunizing people right now that had the infection. Okay, if you had the infection confirmed, you've got natural immunity at a likelihood greater than the effectiveness 
of the vaccine, right? It's greater than 95%. Matter of fact, the study out of the UK two weeks ago showed that out of 6,600 healthcare workers who had COVID, less than 1% developed a reinfection. We don't see reinfections, okay? I know it doesn't meet all the fancy criteria of the New England Journal of Medicine and JAMA, that the, there's not been a randomized control trial showing that reinfection rates are low. You know, we haven't randomized two similar identical countries to, <laughs> you know, getting, uh, studying the reinfection rate in one versus, you know, the other country that didn't have any, you know, it didn't meet the elaborate standards of the journal. You know, I, I love it. Today I was submitting something. You can't start a sentence with a number, right? Like, how dare you, you bad, bad researcher. It has to, you have to spell it out but you can't have a number you, you, to start a sentence. You, you should we, we, you should respond with a bulleted number list. One, um, you guys are idiots. <laughs> Two, STFU. Three. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we need to just look at observational data. We've not seen massive rates of reinfection in Italy or in Wuhan or in the rest of Europe or the rest of the world or in New York or in the entire country. So, okay, now maybe that'll change with the Brazilian str strain. There's laboratory evidence that it might be starting to mutate around um, your body's immunity and around vaccinated immunity. That's something we'll keep an eye on. But we've got a vaccine right now and we've got to make real world decisions. My parents are high risk. They can't get their hands on a vaccine, okay? Meanwhile, some 26-year-old who injects Botox for a living got it from their friend because there was an allocation for healthcare workers, even though that person already had the infection and they're being called now for their second dose. This is yeah, yeah, insanity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't need AI. We just yeah, need We I. need AI. Yeah, so you, I think what you nailed is exactly the frustration, right? So you have this misallocation of the resource, mis, a lack of just general intelligence. So. I absolutely agree that if you've already had COVID and there's a scarcity of vaccine, you let someone, or you allocate that vaccine to people who haven't had COVID because that's gonna be the highest bang for the vaccine. I absolutely agree that here we are like going, when are our high risk parents gonna get this vaccine? You wanna hear a funny story. So I was doing a live show for my supporters yesterday and um, my mom texts me during the show and I, I never ignore a text from your mom, dude. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Like you and I could be talking right now, I'm gonna interrupt it. So I look over at the text and she says, hey, you'll never believe what happened. Your dad and I got a text from the doctor's office and they said, we have a small allocation right now. If you come to the parking lot, we'll give it, give you this vaccination. They're in their, in their 70s and 80s. And they ran and got the vaccine. And the look, you could see the audience was just like, watch his face. I was just like, <gasps> yeah, like this huge relief. Right, like, cause I was feeling guilty because, and I'll tell you why I got the vaccine, Marty, if, if you wanna hear it, and this is an emotional reason. You know, I have a, I have a Factor V Leiden and Prothrombin 20210A. So if I get infected, chances are I might get a blood clot. You never know, I'm probably okay, I'm 47, but still. I do see patients at UNLV, but not as many as, you know, a full-time practitioner does. And I have guests in the studio, so I'm always mindful of that. But the main thing was I had heard that locally, the system that was giving out the shots, 30 or 40% of healthcare professionals were declining the vaccination and the shots were sitting there in their allocation for the tier that I was in. And I said, if these people are saying, no, I'm not taking a vaccine from someone else, I'm gonna go get it. I got it, immediately felt guilty because my parents couldn't get it and they're at vastly higher risk. And then so the huge relief when they just luckily got it yesterday, it shouldn't be luck. It should be that we have systems to do this. Well, like I, I don't, I don't blame anyone who's gotten the vaccine or two doses, even if they shouldn't have gotten it, because I blame the CDC. I blame our medical establishment. I blame all the people sending the message. I blame the hospital leaders who are saying, well, it's just too much work and too much money for us to set up a little community vaccination table in our lobby we don't get paid for it and we don't have the staff, even though they're the largest employer in the state. And so for that reason, we're just gonna give it to anybody who works from home, including 23 year old grad students at Columbia University. <laughs> <laughs> but but they're perfectly okay suing the crap out of low income patients for not paying their bills, right? Yeah, I, yeah that's another topic. By yeah. the way, we've shut down a lot of the practice 
of hospitals suing patients. It's been a nice follow up to the book. Um, That's so, great. That's really uh, great. It's, it's been encouraging to see that. That's really great. Um, so, but, yeah, I, you know, the last thing we want is a food fight over, you know, this sort of polarizing language that, you, you know, somebody is all good or all evil. Yes. Like, we all want what's best for people. There's been bad guidance out there. Let's not blame people who got a vaccine. Let's just evolve our strategy as the data comes out. We have more data now than we did three weeks ago. And, it, you know, it's becoming more clear. That's why the UK is issuing this strong guidance to telling people to delay their second dose. Well, what do you think uh, of the Johnson & Johnson one dose uh, option here? Well, like, you know, it's probably true that any vaccine that you give a second time is going to augment your immunity a little bit, yeah. right? That's probably true. Just you know, from if you first just principles. Think in terms of the immune system of any vaccine. And the question is, at what point are you getting pretty good protection? With influenza, we say that's about 40 to 60 percent, right? Right. Imagine back when we had the stated goal of getting a vaccine with more than 50 percent efficacy, right? That was the bar that the FDA had. By the way. In terms of the FDA, why the heck does Moderna have to apply to put 15 doses in a vial instead of 10 doses? I know. It's just, it, what the heck? <laughs> what the, anyway, separate topic. So we have the stated goal of getting a vaccine that was going to be 50% effective. Imagine somebody, imagine a, a scientist came on the Z Dog MD show and made an announcement to the world I have discovered a vaccine and it is. 80% effective and even 91% effective four weeks later. And by the way, if you give it a second time, it'll boost it up to 95 and maybe increase the durability. You'd say, okay, you know what? Forget the second part. Let's just give this out to as many people as we can and then talk about the second dose. Right, right. Wouldn't we? Yeah, it makes sense. And, and you know, that's why I think the Johnson & Johnson thing's interesting. You know, one interesting spin on that, because it's an adenovirus vector, you do wonder if this, they're doing second dose trials now to see, does it make it better? You wonder if you're actually gonna develop immunity to the vector, and so your second dose can be less effective at, at getting that DNA into cells. So there's some interesting ins and outs, but it doesn't matter. The bottom line is what you said. Look, <laughs> the amount of vaccine efficacy that we've been blessed with in these vaccines is absurdly high compared to what we all hoped. In the beginning of this thing, man, I was like, we'll get 30% efficacy if we're lucky because it's a coronavirus. You know, these things are squirrely, you know, and already you can see it's variating its way down to 50%. 50%, that's amazing. <laughs> and you're still preventing severe disease in most of these cases, which is all you really care about. Like, oh, I got an asymptomatic case. It's like, yeah, well, you know, are, are you, as, as Doc Vader says when he talks about patient satisfaction, did you die? Did you die? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, why are we just talking about efficacy in terms of people who didn't get the infection? Why is that our endpoint? Shouldn't it be who, how many people survive? How many people live? I mean, nobody has died um, for missing or delaying the second dose. In the trials, no one who got a vaccine died, period. Now, subsequently, there is... Uh, at least one reported case in Europe of somebody who died uh, at three weeks, but nobody from missing or delaying the second dose. Um, so look, if even those who get the infection have some partial immunity and it downgrades the illness to a mild or moderate case from a severe case, that's a win, right? That's not a failure. And so I think we need to put things in context. I, I was doing some research, uh, um, Zubin, for the piece on people who had COVID should not be getting immunized right now, as long as we're supply constrained for the Washington Post. Wait, 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 stop, 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 stop. You said something that disagrees with me. You did research before you spoke. What's wrong with you, Marty? <laughs> <laughs> I, I did it backwards. I should have just blurted something out. And then and confirmed then the bias, right. Confirm the bias with the cherry picked studies, right. No, so tell me, so you were searching this thing for that piece on in Washington Post about people who've already had COVID. So I found this study, it was in 2005, it was published, where they looked at the few living survivors from the 1918 Spanish flu. Okay, these are people who were alive when they did this study in 2005. 32 people they found, okay? They actually took their blood and checked their immune system and they had functioning memory T cells that produced neutralizing antibodies <laughs> against the Spanish flu virus, uh, okay? 
eight, almost nine decades later, you know, and people are saying, oh, we don't, you know, we don't know. There's no data on natural immunity. Now, granted, that was the influenza virus. This is coronavirus. But still, um, yeah. you know, the other studies now are showing that even if you live with somebody who had the infection and you didn't develop symptoms, chances are you've got memory T cells that are functioning. Yeah, you know, and it, it's it's funny because those outliers are like superstars genetically as it is. So maybe they just have better T cell memory, but I don't think so. I think you're right. I think that we have this very robust immune response to these infections. And and now, you know, the, the measured immunogenicity in the trial data, but again, we don't really know. We the, What are the neutralizing antibody correlates of immunity, right? We don't fully know. We can look out in the world and go, oh, hey, look, your pool guy's here. Uh, you, you, um, Where's your mask, Marty? That's what I'm gonna Important ask. Work. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> so this is critical work. It's critical work. The the key the key thing is the the um, immune memory is going to be strong, and it's going to be these things that we don't typically measure in standard assays. The other thing is, if you I was I made this horrible mistake, Marty, and you know what this mistake is. I watched the news yesterday. And you mean the entertainment industry? Uh, sorry, the entertainment industry, the clickbait entertainment <laughs> algorithm industry. I partook in it. And this is what I saw, because I never watch actual TV news because I'm, why would I do that? I have the internet where I can be misguided in words and little video clips instead of an anchor on CNN. So I, I, I go on YouTube and I watch the news agency's clips. Oh my God, if, if I were a little old lady sitting in my house watching that, I would think the world was ending. I would think that there was no immunity to COVID. The variants were all gonna kill us. They, every piece of positive news that they put out is followed up by, but we're all gonna die. And I, I, I feel like they're preying on our negativity bias as humans, that, that how we're wired to detect threat. And it's really harming our ability to actually proceed with effective measures because everyone's so pessimistic. You, you know, um... It's been um, sort of a scientific exercise to make projections up until this point. And actually, you, you're able to do it with some degree of precision if you really read up on everything and talk to the experts. But right now, there's a big unknown, and that's the variants. Ho putting those aside, because they, that could be a you know, game change if they mutate around natural or vaccinated immunity. Assuming that we are able to get ahead of, of that and, and not fall behind the eight ball, Given the current rate of deceleration, the sheer number of Americans who have natural immunity, probably somewhere over 100 million, let's, let's say you know, roughly 30 to 50%. You add to that another 100 million that have been vaccinated, which we're gonna hit that number in March, you know, given the current rates, we could see a really low threat by April in some restoration of normal life. Now, a lot of people will be timid and understandably so, but I mean, we might see a rapid deceleration barring the threat of new variants. And, and you know, that's good news. Like that is something that's at hand. It's, we're close to it. And I couldn't disagree more when I hear the, the establishment experts say, we have to vaccinate 75 to 80% of the public. Have you heard this? Yes. I have. In, order, in order to get to herd immunity. No. No. We, yes, we should, but we don't have to in order to get to herd immunity. A hundred million plus people have natural immunity right now. And that is driving some of this slowing. Yeah. And that's good news. Yeah. It, it's, it's, and, 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 you know, this is where you and Offit will definitely agree in that he said the same thing. You know, by April, we're going to see this thing really start to tip because the combination of exactly that natural immunity and vaccine immunity. And like you said, natural herd immunity as a strategy comes at a huge cost. You're, you're killing a lot of people. You're causing some long haul COVID, which we still don't entirely understand a little bit of MISC in children, which we don't fully understand. And, uh, um, and, and so that's not a real strategy, but now out of no choice, we have that as a partial strategy and vaccination as, as a very deliberate strategy. And I think the days of this thing are numbered, which means your and I ratings, okay, are going down because people are gonna be like, I no longer <laughs> care about medicine. <laughs> 
<laughs> our, our, the value of our information is expiring. It's like MCATs, right? Uh, three years, your MCAT expires, <laughs> right? You would no longer have the knowledge <laughs> from studying for the MCATs. It just dropped off the cliff and you are disqualified from applying to be a doctor. It's brilliant, right? I mean, the thing has a shelf life, man. It's like the expiration date on your milk. By the way, my daughter is obsessed with expiration dates because one time she threw up from some bad salmon or something. And so she has this you know, conditioned fear. So she's obsessively checking expiration dates. And I tried to tell her, your daddy eats things that are four months expired and, and does it with pride, all right? It's called building your microbiome. It, it's a key thing. I mean, sure, every now and again, he'll shard a little, but it's worth it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe she threw up because it was too freshly caught. It was caught like 30 minutes before she ate it. She, she, I heard a school nurse, so she was at some like swanky private school in Las Vegas. And uh, back then when we did private school and uh, cause it was Las Vegas. And she said, you know, the, the school nurse told me, yeah, there was a student complaining, came into my office with a stomach ache. And I said, what do you think it was? What did you eat? And he goes, no, it's what I didn't eat. I didn't have my wild grass fed beef last night and now my stomach hurts. And I was like, so, so you have a grass fed beef deficiency? Really, this is how we're raising our children. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, hey, I love um, watching you and Vinay, man. Vinay Prasad, you guys have some great content. And the, the piece on um, no one should die alone was so moving. It is a human rights violation for us to say loved ones can't be with their family member when they, but you guys are doing great work and I'm, I'm, I've been loving every minute of it. Dude, you guys gave Vinay a platform on MedPage today. It's so funny how like all these like people congregate. Like I, I hope we're not just, forming an echo chamber because we actually disagree about a lot of stuff, but it's like, it's funny. We all are like, yeah, Vinay, Marty, like let's all hang out. And on MedPage, Vinay does his uh, his stuff. It's true. I mean, I read it and I go, I've changed my thinking about something. Like I was on the fence about something. Yeah, Vinay and and you, you know, I'll credit you with this too, like, like to challenge deeply held assumptions that really borderline on dogma, things we need to, to question. And um, Vinay has put out some really good pieces in MedPage. We love having them write for us. And, um, you know, we're trying to push the field. Um, I've got a piece coming out uh, now, should be out right now, on uh, why we should be delaying that second dose uh, for our patients and, and increase our vaccine capacity. Uh, and also, we're trying to find, give people a forum so they don't have to go through the clunky journals. You know, our study that was grant funded as the largest study of COVID data to date ever conducted in claims data. The ultimate analysis of risk factors for mortality has been under journal peer review for six months. <laughs> and it's not yet. Now it's up on uh, Med Archive, right. but MedPage today was able to do a piece on it and talk about the preprint service. And, you know, Harlan Krumholtz and I had a nice discussion about it. Does it make sense if you discover the cure for breast cancer, does it make sense for someone to submit it in abstract form, wait six months for the national meeting, present it, have two months to submit it to a journal, put it under a six month peer review, and then put it in a queue to be published three months later, only for then some people to start picking it up and start talking about it. If you have the cure for cancer, tell people tomorrow, today, right? And that's where we've got, we've, there's a lot of opportunity to change how we share information in medicine. Yeah, I think it's really interesting, you know, and, the, and of course the, the, the other side of that is the concern that you end up with like a vitamin C sepsis thing again, where, you know, you have um, science by press release and then you do the follow-up randomized trials and it doesn't pan out. But I think, especially in a pandemic. Well, the journals do that too. Ah, you know, tell me about that. People forget, tell the me about journals that. publish shit all the time. <laughs> Right, false stuff, retract. I mean, yeah. that's the thing. People, you know, pulled up the journals as like this safeguard. Do you think that journal reviewing our study for for six months is ask has the data set and is doing their own regression analysis? Do they interview the patients? Do they look in our cabinet? No, they're reading a a a, a thing we write up. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. like the FDA, they just read what we write out. So you're basically admitting to fraud here, Marty, is what you're telling me is that you just <laughs> wrote it. But actually, well, oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, No, it's just the, the peer review is also a bit of a scam in the sense yeah. that doctors are not paid for it, right? So it's like we, we work like crazy 
And then, oh, volunteer your time so our private company can make money from selling the copyrighted uh, uh, version of what we produce. The journals. And we'll just sign the copyright over to them for free oh, because that's how it's done. And by the way, it's prestigious and you can get promoted for doing that process. What the? Pay the doctors, right? Yeah. If you're going to peer review, pay them and turn it around in three days. Yeah, I, I, that's brilliant. I mean, the, the whole thing is really backwards. It's, it's designed for a different era when a bunch of old guys sat around a table scratching their beards and, well, you know, <laughs> did you see this table? How about this table? What about the P value? And now it's like, you know, we have a thing called the internet. We have actually citizen scientists too who can contribute quite a bit. Um, it's just how do you actualize that and how do you make that actually work? It, it's really interesting. You know, so your study actually, the one that's on MedArchive right now, um, you you were looking at risk factors for coronavirus and it's really interesting what you found. Tell, tell us what those top risk factors were because I was kind of like, oh, I didn't know that when it first came out. Yeah, I'm so interesting what was not really known, but was suspected a little bit. The number one condition that predicted COVID mortality with the highest associated risk with sickle cell disease. Wow. Makes sense, you know, from what you were saying about your um, Leiden deficiency, it is a largely a vascular disease, right? COVID is largely a vascular disease. There was that paper in April in JAMA that said 40% of the deaths from COVID were vascular related, you know, either a uh, pulmonary embolism or something vascular related. Yeah. And so, you know, we learned anticoagulation. And um, then um, after that was kidney disease. Now that has a lot of public policy implications because as you, you know, you may have seen from me uh, speaking or shouting, I want to say <laughs> sharing on Twitter. <laughs> Okay, Twitter's a nasty place. Everything seems like a shout. Okay, to, to talk to Vinay for five seconds about Twitter and you will get him, you know, Vinay's quite calm until he escalates. And then he is just cursing and deep. It's on Twitter. I can't even, these make me want to die. And I was like, Vinay, Vinay, deep breath, brother. You're across the table from me. We're, at, we're in droplet range. <laughs> Yeah, I, I barely mentioned Twitter to him once and he like almost started picking up chairs and throwing them. Yeah, you know, he's like he, off the he, top rope, like ready to just come down. <laughs> so tell me about your Twitter shouting. Twitter's nasty, but um, it's a nasty place. But 7,500 dialysis centers in the United States give the flu shot every year efficiently and early with a very high uptake rate among kidney disease patients. Okay. They're set up to do this. Here is the number one most common risk factor, kidney disease. And we didn't give the dialysis centers the coronavirus shot, the, the vaccine. I mean, here's a clear. So I've been out there, you know, on Twitter and I suggested to the, to the Department of Health and Human Services. It's not just CVS and Walgreens you guys got to hit. Dialysis centers, 7,500 of them. And, and a whole bunch of nephrologists have been basically saying, yeah, give it, just give it to us, okay? You, you want to spend $400 billion setting up new sites? Give it to the, you know, us at the dialysis centers and we will give it out reliably as they do every single year. Yeah. I mean, and again, the, 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 our system failures in the US, you know, there was a f the funny, like, I guess there was an SNL cold open. I'm like, does anything in America work anymore? You know, it's a, it, hopefully there's a wake up that, you know, we do need some systems thinking. You know, I always talk about, where is it? Here it is. I talk about the elephant and the rider, like, our unconscious emotional mind, our thinking thoughtful brain, and these are humans and we're systems and we're always kind of this kind of dyad. But what are they What are they walking on is a path. A path is our systems design, our, our, our protocols, our financial incentives, our business structures, our peer review process, our, our dissemination of information, the Twitter, the Twitter. I said the Twitter because I'm old, Marty. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and as a result, if we don't design that path, in a way that we want that elephant and rider to go down the least resistance path and it's good for everybody, then we're, we're screwing up and we don't really do that very well in the US anymore. So hopefully we can get back on that. Yeah, and you know, thanks for, for um, promoting civil conversations. I mean, I, I try to listen to every Z Dog episode with an open mind that, you know what, this might challenge some deeply held assumptions that I have and that's okay, you know, that's the scientific process. Um, but yeah, I would love to see, Met Archive has done an incredible job during a pandemic. Gosh, can you imagine if we didn't have Met Archive? I just saw um, Dr. Ho. So Fauci is kind of like the celebrity doctor, right? And to be honest with you, not a knock on him, he's a really nice guy, but I, I don't 
learn anything from anything he says. It's, I don't know if it's just too general or whatever. Dr. Ho, Dr. David Ho at Columbia University, famous virologist. He's the dude, okay? That's the guy that I love to listen to. And he's not, you know, slick on TV like Fauci. So, of course, you know, the news organizations don't have him on. You know, there's a certain TV, you know, style that they like. Ho doesn't have it. But Ho is a genius, okay? I read everything this guy puts out. Look at what he put out. A paper that came out on MedArchives showing that the vaccines were less effective against the Brazilian and South African strains, okay? The quote almost blew into the pool, but I'm going <laughs> to leave it to you here. <laughs> okay, he said, look, if the rampant spread of the virus continues and more critical mutations accumulate, then we may be condemned to chasing after the ever-evolving SARS-CoV-2 continually, as we have long done for influenza. Mm. I mean, this dude's a prophet, man. I mean, those, those are not words of wisdom. That's the you know decision tree we're in right now is are we going to let this thing, these variants, you know, dominate or are we going to get a hold and get a handle on this? And if we don't, I mean, I think Dr. Ho is, is right. Yeah, you know, I, I actually Offit did a good piece in JAMA about how we can better get a hold on these variants, and I think it was pretty valid. I'll probably link to it at some point. So basically what I'm getting away from what you just said, Marty, is that the press don't love a Ho. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> they don't love that particular hoe. I mean, maybe there's other eloquent hoes out there. I mean, there's but, lots you know, of those. Yeah. The, the way you have a lab meeting is a, is different from the way you talk in a 30 second soundbite on TV, you know. And I've been trying to do some health promotion through it, media um, just to try to get out some of these things I'm passionate about. But I think we could stand to learn a lot from from Dr. David Ho and the researchers at Columbia University. Uh, I'm going to listen to that ho a little bit more, uh, Marty. I, I'm sorry, I can't. I just can't resist. I'm just a. I'm basically a 12 year old boy trapped in a 47 year old doctor's body, and I have a platform where I can say whatever I want until I get canceled. And I'm just pushing it right to the limit, Marty. That and so so, so funny. We're like we're like. You know, we're like evil twins of each other. Like you're using MedPage, which is this very reputable, like august, you know, scientific thing. And then I'm just like, yo, it's the Z-Dog MD show. I don't love a hoe. It's very yeah, different. But the the Z-Dog show is on MedPage and people get their benefits that's true. right there. So, I mean, that's, that's true. It's probably what's driving a lot of the traffic because- No, we're co-affiliated. Sure yeah. I love I'm it. I'm not sure they're they're um, logging on for, for my articles since I've been known to start sentences with a number. <laughs> We're talking about cancel culture, the journals have been canceling researchers for decades if they start a sentence with a number. Shame on you. You should never do that. <laughs> oh, that is a perfect way to wrap up the show. Marty McCary, man, you always make me laugh. That that's why, look, I don't care. You could be you could be reading the phone book to me and I'd be like, uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I love the way you communicate. And the thing is, because your passion comes through, and the nice thing is you can disagree in a way that's super polite and you can agree in a way that's super disagreeable. And that's a key combination, right? I, I think it's very important to challenge our assumptions any chance we get. So any other pitches before we go to the Z Pack? Um, gosh, uh, I love the Z Pack, and um, I think um, <clears throat> maybe I could send you some of these pieces, and we could post them. But um, hit me up; I'll link. Great work. Yeah, I can't wait. So we'll link to all your stuff. And by the way, if you guys haven't checked out the price we pay, the book that Marty wrote, dude, it's a transformative piece. Um, I'll link to the interview we did about it because you know it just won Business Book of the Year, and it with good cause because our healthcare costs affect all our business acumen in this whole country. It's like an albatross around our neck. And then that's not even talking about the human cost, right? So Marty McCary, man, it's always a joy. So next time let's do this again and let's talk about something even more controversial, like, I don't know, gout. <laughs> <laughs> talk about AI. There or, you go. Or I. <laughs> just I, just I. We just want just intelligence. I. I don't care whether it's a computer, a dog, or a human, just something smart. Um, <laughs> Guys, I love you. Share the show, become a supporter, and we are out. Peace. Become a subscriber. Click the subscribe button, then right to the right of his little bell. Hit that bell. Booyah! You get notifications. Never miss any of our stuff. I love you guys. We out.